chapter 11 is this morning we look at the first four verses. Paul has been walking us through in chapter 10. He's been walking us through at the beginning with some military terms, right? He's been serious about this conflict and what is uh, happening in the Corinthian church, right? We know there are false teachers who are coming in and uh, they are leading the, the Corinthians away. And we see in the Corinthians this desire, there's this, this uh, I don't know, appeasement from these, these false teachers that they enjoy. And so it was beginning in, in uh, chapter 11, Paul is going to begin to, in essence, we'll see in, in these verses, to kind of lower himself to some extent to, to that reasoning. His desire is that they would be fixed and focused and devoted upon Christ. Now, Paul has a unique ministry. He is an apostle, right? He is called upon by God for the planting and, and the formation of the church to be used by the Holy Spirit for such a time as that. And so we want to glean, and, and though Paul is, is doing some specific things to this church and having to, to defend himself, there are things that we can glean from him. Right? We see in him a profound conviction. Paul is devoted. Now, if I was to tell you this morning that Christians should be devoted to Christ, you would say, of course. Right? So that's a no-brainer. But I think if you would agree with me, what we see often uh, throughout church history, throughout the formation of the church, and even in the time of Paul's life and the things that he's dealing with, and the things that he's writing about, that there's always a tendency for professing Christians to kind of get lost or to lose their way. Things of the culture uh, weigh on us or, or make their way into the church service, and pretty soon we, we've had this moment where we think we're following after Christ, and all of a sudden it's not the Christ of the Bible anymore. Paul will, will touch on that in these verses we'll read here in a moment. But he's completely con uh, convinced and has full conviction that Christ is the answer. Paul is willing to go and to uh, help this church not lose sight um, because he knows, right? He knows the, the sliding away is, is um, not the gospel, right? He, you're departing the true faith. You're leaving Jesus. And so we see Paul's devotion. This reminds me as you think about the way, right? There is a way the Lord has marked out for us. Uh, we Reminded of Jeremiah, right? The early chapters of Jeremiah where God calls through the prophet Jeremiah to Israel to long for the old paths. Come back to the old way. Follow the way, right, that I have mapped out for you. And, and yet Israel decided, no, they want their own, right? We're going we're gonna to go about this our own way. It reminds me of the story of the moment when Alice in Wonderland is talking to the cat, the Cheshire cat. And she asks the question, can you, can you help me uh, go forward from here? Can you tell me which way to go? And he responds with the, the normal question, well, where do you want to go? Where do you want to get to? And she kind of answers and says, well, it doesn't really matter. I don't really know. It doesn't matter which way I go. And then he says, of course, it doesn't matter. Then which way? And I think a lot of times in life, we, we just kind of lose our way. And, and Paul is grabbing hold of this church and saying there is only one way. There's the, the focus needs to be upon Christ and his word, and anything less is to lose sight of that. So he has some, some firm words, and he says some strong things. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11, I'll read 1 through 4, and he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, as we look on this passage this morning, we ask your spirit would be with us, that you would teach us and instruct us. 
Lord, make us mindful of uh, any deviation that we might be experiencing in our own life or thinking about that would take us away from you. Let us realize, Lord, the, the differences between the wisdom that is from you and the wisdom that is from the world. And Lord, get me out of the way. That what we have, Lord, for each of us, what you have for each of us this morning would be exactly what we receive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so Paul has come to the moment, right, where he is going to confront, right? He's going to just uh, go after his opponents. We can say it like that. He is, uh, through chapter 10, he's kind of had some sarcasm. We've noticed that, right? He's kind of mocked them a little bit. In verse 5, he will call these guys these eminent apostles, right? I think you see a, a little bit of sarcasm there. Uh, and even though in verse 13, these false apostles claim to be apostles of Christ, they are in this, this congregation of Corinth claiming to be apostles of Jesus Christ. And so when you begin to see that and understand that, well, you start to realize why Paul is saying what he's saying. They are undermining Paul's calling. They are undermining Paul's mission. They are undermining Paul's, right, the, the call that he has in his life to plant a church. They're undermining all of these things. And Paul simply says in verse 4, you are bearing beautifully with a false Jesus, a false worldly spirit, and a false gospel. I mean, you see in Paul's writing that there is, right, one or the other. There's not a, a multifold gospel. There's only one gospel, and it doesn't matter what you call it if it's not the gospel of Christ. So he expects them, right, to play along with some foolishness. I'm going to lower myself to this level. Since that's how they're reasoning with you, I, will, I guess I will reason the same way. Right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boast with a godly boast, a godly jealousy. I'm going to just come at this level and try to, to just show you and remind you that you've placed your faith in Christ. Why are you departing? Why, are, more importantly, are you letting them right, lead you away? So Paul's very serious. I think this is something absent in the church today. The gospel is serious. Right? Where there is a, such things as false preachers. That's what we see. We just read it. If someone comes and they're false apostles and false preachers and false gospels, well, we want to be sure, like Alice in Wonderland, we know the right way to go. Well, we can praise God. He's given us his word, right? This is why we say you know, whoever's in the pulpit and preaching, you should have your Bible open, right? Just don't take my word for it. So Paul is dealing, right, in, in a sense that maybe the Corinthians aren't nearly as serious about this. Uh, maybe they think Paul's a little, he's a little zealous for this. Maybe he's a little crazy, right? He does kind of walk weird and look funny. I mean, whatever their excuses might be. Uh, but, but Paul is really bringing to the forefront the factual reality that if you have attached yourself to a false Jesus, right, you are, you are duped. You are misled. You have attached yourself to a different religion. That's the reality of it. The Christian means to be a Christ follower, right? Specifically, Jesus of Nazareth, the one born in Bethlehem, the one who was sinless, who went to the cross, that Jesus. But there are others who are leading these Corinthians away. So what do we glean, right? What do we grab hold of? Paul has left us at the end of chapter 10 saying his ministry that we are to have in his. And what he desires is that a ministry is commended by the Lord. He boasts only in the Lord. Right? This is who I am. This is where I'm going. You're a part of the sphere. I have held nothing back from you, Corinthians. And now he's going to start to kind of lay it out for us. And so we see in Paul's life, he is devoted, completely devoted to the cause of Christ. He says in verse, uh, verse 1, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. But indeed, you are bearing with me. So Paul says, look, this is the ministry that I want. I want the Lord to commend me. He comes to them. He kind of shifts gears a little bit. We see the, the first person singular, right? He is speaking, I, I am coming to you this way, right? And there's a personal element here. 
Paul will touch on the, the, the pronoun we a little bit, but mostly through this, he is saying, look, this is who I am. Bear with me. I come to you this way. I wish you would do this. I mean, you just see throughout this, Paul's drive is the realization that false teaching can wreck a church. He says, bear with me in a little foolishness, right? He's, he's coming and realizing that there are those who are making inroads. It's not just that they have false teachers. There are those there who are believing the false teachers. So there's the question, right? What's more dangerous than false teaching? That's when false teaching has gained a hearing and it's being implemented Paul says, here's the foolishness. I'm going to reduce myself down to their level, and I pray that you would bear with me. I, I think there's a moment here where I, clearly there's some sarcasm in Paul a little bit, right? I'm going to bear with me this foolishness. If this is who you are and that's how they're operating, I too will join in this foolishness, right? And the word has this idea of, of poor judgment, right? You, Corinthians, you're, you're, you're not thinking right. You have some bad thinking here. When I read that and was studying this, I remember this quote from a John Wayne movie. You know, got to weave John Wayne in periodically. I don't think it originated with him, but there was a quote that he said in a movie line that said, you know, this life is hard and it's harder if you're stupid, right? And I thought about that and I thought, I wonder if Paul's hitting it like this is, it's, just, it's not that hard, follow Christ, right? But you're bearing with this, you have some poor judgment, and they know Paul, and I've said this a few times, he has been there, he has walked with him, he has stressed, even at the beginning of this letter, you know my conduct with you and how I was in the world, he's the real deal. He's focused on the cause of Christ, and he comes not with a, an arrogance that says, hey, I'm going to lift myself up, but he realizes what's at stake. I have to do this so you would come back to Christ. Realize what you're sliding away from. The idea of bear means to put up with. He'll say it twice. He'll use that word twice in this verse alone. So here's the irony. Paul will lower himself. They should know better. They should have understood. They should have grabbed this. They should be convinced and, and convicted about Christ. But Paul finds in himself, no doubt, the report that he is hearing. He must do these things. I will lower myself so maybe I gain a hearing. Paul's going to break his principle, right? I'm not going to commend myself, but here he is. And what's interesting is the last part here is, is can be the verb, can be translated either as an imperative, either he's calling them to bear with me, and it's translated in the dicative in my, in my translation, which means they are already doing this. And the point simply is Paul expects them, right, to, to, to listen to his foolishness, to come down to this level because that's who you are, that's what's going on. You should be convinced of Christ, but you're not. See, the Corinthian church is addicted to essential, uh, sensationalism, right? We have these false teachers. We have this, this great skill. We have these great teachers. We have this, these passionate people. They have these letters, right? They're buying into all this stuff. It feels good. It looks good, right? We see it, and we feel it, and Paul is not that guy, is he? He tells us, I came to you, what? Not in any of that. His message was Christ and him crucified. Why? So that you, you would know your faith is built upon the power of God and not on me. See, Paul understands that and he shouldn't have to say these things again. He is completely sold out to the cause of Christ and he is willing to go the extra mile. We touched on this a little bit last week. We're in the sphere of his ministry. Right, He is to be boundless. He did not withhold anything from the Corinthians. Now Paul is willing right, to go back, to deal with these people. I'm not going to let them steal you away. The question for us is where is our conviction when it comes to this? Are we convinced of Christ? Do we have this conviction? He is, he is writing here at the beginning, the formation of the church, that there are other pastors who preach a different Christ. There are other gospels floating around even now. It sounds like the enemy knows, right? He wants to dilute the gospel, dilute these things. Let's just not, let's not tolerate doctrine because unity is great and we just want to endorse one another and pretty soon we, 
find ourselves not sold out to the cause of Christ. We're just simply sold out for us. So there's a real, right at the beginning of this, Paul sets this conviction. There is his tone. I'm willing, again, to go the extra, the extra mile, the extra limits. I am not going to let them steal you away from the true and only Jesus. He's sold out to the cause of Christ. We also see, right, naturally flows as it goes into verse 2, the singularity of Christ. Paul begins to unfold some, some illustrations just in case they're not tracking Right? Are you not hearing what I'm saying? So he says in verse 2, For I am, a, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband. So that to Christ I might present you a pure virgin. So here it is. Here's the jealousy. Here's the reasoning. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Right? I'm coming with this conviction because I have a godly jealousy for you. So he wants to guard the people. Right here, it's a, it's a divine jealousy. We know from Scripture we're not to have any type of jealousy. Our God is a jealous God. We're not to have any other gods. But clearly the Lord has, has put a burden upon, the Holy Spirit, a burden upon Paul's heart to, to go after this church, to the well-being of this church. I mean, he's laid some groundwork there, right? He's the church planter. And it really summarizes Paul's love and his devotion, right? The singularity of Jesus. Jesus to Paul is worth it. Paul has demonstrated this, no doubt, right? In his time spent there and how he taught them, right? His, his uh, ministry cor- uh, correspondence, his, his question and answer times, right? No doubt, Today we could translate in the times we had coffee together, the times that we dealt with that question, or, or the times we were at, at church. He has demonstrated, right? He has shown his love for this church. And he tells them, look, I didn't just do this for my sake. I, I planted you upon Christ. And then he comes and he says, for I betrothed you to one husband. Right? He's getting at the doctrinal purity of the church. He's using this illustration, this metaphor for us, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Here Paul takes on, right, some of the, of the Old Testament idea. We see uh, the, in the Old Testament that the Israel was betrothed, right, to, to the bride, right, as the bride to God. We see the, the same metaphor utilized in Ephesians 5. We see it here. The church is the bride of Christ. Right, he's bringing all that language in here and saying, I have betrothed you to one husband. I've joined you. My desire is to join you, to present you, to make you available. Those are what the words mean, that you would be engaged, that you are accessible, that you are, you're the right uh, bride for this groom. I've labored hard to, to deal with all the bad theology and, and work out these, these bad teachers and fix these things. So I am come, right, as the friend. Paul is the friend of the bridegroom. I'm a friend of the church. I'm a guardian right over this bride. And I present her to the one who is faultless, to the one husband. All right, here's, here's what Paul is illustrating, right? There is one man, one husband. Here's our, our, our picture. There's no other. The man is Christ, his loyalty to the church is faultless, Jesus is perfect, right? The woman is the church, and Paul is saying, man, she needs some care and some watchfulness. Now, culturally, right, the betrothed, just so you know, was a period that lasted for a year. Even though they didn't come together as a married couple, in essence, they were treated like a married couple. Uh, so from the day of being betrothed, they, in essence, were legally husband and wife, right? She was to remain pure until the actual wedding day, but they were treated as a married couple. And the engagement was not to be broken. A broken engagement was the equivalent of a divorce, right? So Paul is, is saying, it's not because they're betrothed, we're not in this yet. He's saying, right, there's a day when Christ comes, it's all new. He's been maybe hinting at that, but here he's saying, you are already married to Christ, he is your one husband, right? When you bring it to reality, what is he telling the church? Yeah, you're looking for another husband. The church is to remain doctrin- doctrinally pure. The church is to be ready to present themselves, right, before Christ. 
This is true to Scripture, Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that, excuse me, but that she would be holy and blameless. So Paul's labor, right? Paul's labor here and the singularity of Christ is simply saying, don't deviate. I mean, we see this throughout church history. We see it in the Old Testament. Language, right? When the Israelites went to other gods, language such as harlotry is used. They have moved away from their one true God. And no doubt Paul is bringing, right, the, the focus here, bring it practical into your own life, into your own marriage. How would you feel if one is moving away? Well, he brings it right to the church and say, this is how the Lord loves his church. This is how he spilled blood for his church. He is the one true husband. Why are you walking away? Why are you letting them lead you away? There's the seriousness of it with Paul. I mean, if Paul was alive today, he'd have some things to say, wouldn't he? He's saying it now. You know, I think the church is looking for other things. We've kind of lost our way. Who is this Jesus? There, we suffer from equivocation. There's loads of everything out there that we attach Christian to. We think, well, that's Christian. That has nothing to do with Scripture. It reminds me of the story of the old farm couple were driving in their truck, and the wife says, you know, we don't sit together in the truck anymore. I used to sit next to you. The husband says, as he's holding the steering wheel and driving the truck, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> You're sliding down the bench. And I think that's what the church does. God hasn't moved. He hasn't deviated. He hasn't changed. We're being led away. And Paul's very serious with this illustration. What you feel to play the role, right? The church is playing the role of harlotry. When we look for other, we bring the culture in when we dilute the gospel. So what does what does Paul drive here, right? Here's the contrast, verse three. Simply, I just simply say devoted to maturing. We have to come back. We've got to know who he is. He says, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So here's Paul's fear, right? Another illustration for us. The Corinthians are in danger of the serpent. I mean, think about it. Paul is simply saying in the church, He's referring to these false eminent apostles, these guys who claim to be of Christ. He's referring to them as servants of Satan. I mean, that's the reality. What is happening? He's saying this, I, I fear, I'm worried, I'm afraid that Satan is, is whispering in your ear. He's got you held up by the nose and he's flanking you now and, and pretty soon you're going to be out. So to understand what Paul is getting at, what we have to do is, is look at these verses. You can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. I'm just going to read verses 3 through 6 this morning. What is this deception? What do we learn? What do we glean from it? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, God has, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So Paul is referencing this moment. He's saying, I fear for you, Corinthians, because you are being deceived. 
But here's the deception, right? The serpent comes, as we've just read, and poses a question. Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Right? So he exaggerates the question. Makes it bigger than what it actually is. I mean, Satan is posing a question that's saying, I'm really surprised that God has prohibited. I mean, he's this God of love. He's prohibited from you from eating the trees of the garden? He's already lying. Now Eve responds, and she corrects right, this apparent misconception. The woman said to the serpent from the fruit of the trees, yeah, we can eat. No, we can. But from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, right, she changes that a little bit. God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, she clearly understands the command, right? I mean, there's no doubt the command, God said, don't eat it, we'll die. She makes that statement. She understands. But Satan's focus is on the issue of the penalty, right? That's what he's getting at. And so what does he do? What does Satan do? And this, we learn this from his tactics, He has this frontal attack, doesn't he? There's a frontal attack, and then he also flanks Eve. It's a flanking action, completely military. All right, now any military strategist would know, right, frontal attacks don't usually work unless there's a flanking action. It makes you think, you've ever seen Patton, how Patton beat Rommel in in the desert, right? He held him by the nose, he had a frontal attack, and then he flanked them, and that's right typical. And this is what the enemy is doing. The frontal attack is what? Flat contradiction to God's word. He calls God a liar. You shall not surely die. There's the frontal attack. Doesn't let Eve respond to that. She doesn't doesn't let that sink in. He doesn't come and say God's a liar. He says you will surely not die. And then he comes with this flanking action. And he gives his, his, his what he proposes were the reasons why God has done this. Right? He's, he's charged God with lying, and that doesn't sink in. He doesn't give time for that frontal hit for us to go, wait a minute, time out here. And he immediately comes from the side, and he directs Eve's attention to the reasons. And now we're not talking about the commands of God anymore. We're talking about the reasons. We have completely stepped away. The premise has changed. It's not about who God has said. He is God. That has moved away. We are now talking about yeah, this really is unfair. We've changed the conversation. His reason, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be, will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So it's a masterful ploy, isn't it? I mean, he's not called the father of lies for nothing. And if you think about it, his reasons, taken in isolation, are verbally accurate. If they eat, their eyes will be opened. That is true. They will become as God. We'll talk about it here in a moment. Yep. They know good and evil. See, the deception for Eve is not in, in the words themselves. What he is saying, because we've gotten past the commands of God, and now we're having this conversation, and now God is unfair, he's implying that this would be a good thing. Don't you want the wisdom of God? That sounds really good. You're right. The flinking action is worse. She's no longer thinking about who God is, what God has said. She's now thinking about, you know, God's heart is a little bit closed off, isn't it? God isn't loving me like he really should love me. See, the reality for us is, right, we can often catch, I think, the frontal attacks. They may shake us, maybe reword it a little bit, but we don't always catch these flinking actions. And pretty soon we're not talking about right and wrong because God is and his standard and his word says this and we believe it. We're now talking about, wait a minute, that's not right and that doesn't apply to this situation. That's what happens where our reasoning changes, right? What happens in this, this moment, is when they eat the fruit, fruit, excuse me, they become independent. They become their own independent moral agents. We have right here in this moment in history, first ever where you have situational ethics, Right, the, Satan has changed the conversation. Listen to this. She says, when the woman saw, right, this is verse 6, 
that the tree was good for food. She's reasoning different now, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and there's Adam standing there, right? So okay, he's persuaded, and she gave also to her husband with her, and they ate. See, situational ethics, what happens when the, the motive of the lawgiver is in question? That's what's going on. We've questioned the, the, the fact that God is, he's not really loving us if we can't get a hold of that wisdom. So we set that aside now, the ethical decision comes down to, is it useful? And so Satan has completely moved past the commands of God. We entered into a conversation of the reality that now I'll make this decision because I have seen that it is good. I've looked upon the fruit It does look desirable. I do want to be wise. And see, the proof of this is this moment, right, where the lie is. You will become like, how do they become like God? See, when Adam chose, I mean, he was persuaded by his wife. He chose to worship creation over the creator. It doesn't make any sense. He was persuaded. He chose. When he did this, he disobeys God's command. He chose to disbelieve his creator. He chose not to follow his creator. Instead, he chose his own way. He's become his own lawgiver. He's become his own master. Right? He lives independent now of his creator. He's made that statement. He's become an independent moral agent. How does he become like God? He will now dictate what is right what is wrong he does as he pleases no one will tell Adam what have you done right he's taking on that role the issue is obedience or disobedience right does the the mind and will of man is it right for them to make uh, moral decisions to be moral independent but this is what they've chosen so God does the gracious thing right he kicks them out of the garden they become immortal in this state, there's no redemption for them. So how do we apply this? This is, this is what uh, Genesis 3 is, is teaching us. What, how do we apply it to the church? Paul is simply saying these false teachers have come in, right? There is this tactic where they, maybe they've said things a little bit different. You didn't catch the frontal attack, but now they're coming. They're coming on the side. Paul over and over and over again has said, you should understand this, right? You should be seeing this for what it is. You should be growing past the milk and into the meat. Why? Because there are false pastors out there. There are false Jesuses. There's false gospels, even in Paul's day. So what should the Christian be doing? We should have our Bibles open. We should be maturing in the faith. We should be questioning what's being preached, what's being taught. Is that true to Scripture? Is it not? And we should have no problem rejecting things that simply because they're called Christian, if if they're contrary to the Word of God, we must eject them. What would Satan love to do more than anything, right? Oh, that's not, the commands are good. Oh, don't worry about that, right? Remember, he packages it through his wife. He gets Adam to sin through his wife. How do these lies end up in your living room? They come through our loved ones. So that you would be more tempted to compromise because it's your loved one. This is what he's doing. He's a punk, right? But this is what's happening. He says to this church, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of you. Just like the serpent, right? Led you astray. He's leading you astray, away from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. The church, in Paul's right language, is simply saying, Corinthians, right, you're, you're, you're kicking God out of your church. You're kicking God out of your congregation. You're taking his standard and saying, you know what, we're going to tweak that thing. We're going to make it our own because we're independent now. We'll decide what is right, what is wrong. So when objective truth is gone, we can make anything true. It's popular today in many churches to just simply don't, don't say the Bible says. That's wrong. Popular pastors made those statements. You can't trust the Bible in a pulpit making these statements. Right? Brothers, sisters, what do we have if we don't have the Bible? Well, we can have anything we want. That's where that leads. 
So if the enemy can cast doubt on the scriptures, cast doubt on Christ, lead you away, it's not that frontal attack. It's always the flanking action. It'll change the conversation. You lose sight of the fact that God is, and what God commands must stand. You lose sight of that, and you begin to reason. Oh, it does look good. I do deserve this wisdom. It does look like good fruit. I think I'll go ahead and eat it. So this leads, I believe, Paul, as he's reasoning this out, right? Pouring his, his, his tears over this church. <clears throat> it leads to my last point here, verse 4. Intolerant threat of wrong teaching of Jesus. We, just, we have to come to a place, right, that we say, yeah, that's not true. Here's why. It's not because I say. But we exegete, we historically and grammatically understand God's word, we logically ap- apply these tools, we can, we can arrive at right conclusions. So my last point, verse 4, he says it. Here's the reason. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Right? They're all over the place. They're not even catching the frontal attacks, right? We realize from this moment, can there be false preachers? Can there be a different spirit? Can there be a worldly spirit in the, in the church? Can there be a different gospel? Yes, 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 and yes. We have those saying there's, there's we're, we're We're proclaiming Jesus, but it's not the one of Scripture. We're proclaiming the gospel. It's not the one Paul has given. You know, the word preach, preaches, right, is publicly announce principles, urging acceptance with confidence. That's what that word means. It's not just that they're saying it, man. They're telling you this is it. This is the way. And the word beautifully, they're putting up with this beautifully. Beautifully simply means it's not only are they tolerating it, they prefer it. There's that, right, that, that ability to speak, they must be right. Paul's short and looks funny. He can't be right, right? My eyes tell me this. It comes down to what are they saying? Here's the itching ears, right? When Paul tells Timothy, we think of this verse, 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but want to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Even in Paul's day, he is saying this. There's going to be people. So when we talk about Jesus, we must say it's the Jesus of Nazareth born in Bethlehem. Right? Paul is telling them these guys are not commissioned by Jesus. They're coming in their own authority. They're servants of Satan. You need to wake up, right, and come to the terms of this. You're you're believing in a pseudo-Jesus who's different from the one I have preached. There's a different spirit. There's worldly ideas making their way into the church. There's not love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. The Holy Spirit, this is a worldly spirit. There's divisions. A different gospel. If you believe in the wrong Jesus, you have the wrong gospel. Paul says this in Galatians 1, 6, and 7. I am amazed that you are so quickly discerning him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Jesus, right? The gospel of Christ. You notice he says it's, it's not denying the gospel. It is distorting the gospel. It's not the frontal attack. No, we're preaching a gospel, right? That's the flanking action. It's a distorted gospel. So I was studying and when working through this passage this week, I was uh, listening to a, a, uh, a podcast of this guy talking about um, coming out of the Bethel Church movement and I find that so interesting that there's so many people that are just simply, if you're familiar with that, if you have questions, you can talk, talk to me w- later, but it, they're just so lost. They've completely departed the faith. And in one of the books that they were referencing, it was a book called The Physics of Heaven. He made this point 
that, you know, how is it that new age and humanism and all these things are making the culture? How is the culture coming back into the church? Why is the church grabbing hold of those things on the outside and bringing them in? And I thought this quote was so revealing. They seem to believe that the, the New Age movement and these things in the culture are actually things stolen from the church and repackaged, and they've taken the position that we want to bring them back into the church. I listen to the quote. He says, they, referring to the New Age, he says, they, the New Age, have been trafficking in the church stolen goods for a long time. I have found throughout Scripture at least 75 examples of things that the New Age has counterfeited such as having a spirit guide, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and, and more. These actually belong to the church, but they have been stolen and cleverly repackaged. The church is struggling today because we look to the culture. You have a church here that's saying these are actually Christian things. There are people who attend these churches and the multi-campuses that they have who think this is Christianity. I'm going to tell you with all complete conviction, they're following a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. When that standard is changed, when God's word is removed, we can make him say anything we please to the point where we'll look literally at the New Age movement and say they have taken those things from Christianity. Paul's drive here, right? You bear with this. You put up with this. You, you hold on to these things. You're enduring this. Paul sees the danger for what it is. When we understand these things this way, we can say, I understand why Paul is afraid. I'm afraid for you. I fear for you. You're believing a different, a different Christ. See, the one thing that Paul understands, one of many things we could say, he knows that we don't win every fight. There are some, no doubt, in Corinth who are not going to believe on Christ. He trusts the Spirit for that. He knows that we don't win every fight, but he also knows that we lose every fight we don't fight. And today we simply go along with all these things and say, well, they, they attach the word Christian to it. It must be true. And Paul is advocating that we would be so devoted to the cause of Christ, the singularity of Christ, and so devoted to maturing in Christ that we would grow to a point where we don't accept wrong teachings about our Savior. And that we, full of grace and mercy, would encourage those who might be lost and we would explain Many, many Christians, even professing Christians, and clearly in our culture, simply don't know the way. We are not like Alice in Wonderland. We do know the way. We know the way, the truth, and the life. His name is Jesus. He's the one true king. He's the one true God. And we must not be those who deviate. Not only for our own souls, for the souls of our brothers and sisters, that we'd edify and encourage one another, but that we would be a voice of outreach, a voice full of compassion, full of grace, because we have, we have a God who is compassionate with us, and has extended to me and to my soul and to your soul amazing grace. And the world will not know him if we don't open our mouths and speak. We're going to close here, and, and uh, we're going to sing this, this song called One True God. And the chorus simply says, you, you are the one, uh, the one alone in greatness, the one who never changes. Jesus, you are the one who rose in power, the one who reigns forever. Jesus, the one true God. So as we close with this chorus, I simply encourage you, make this your confession. Not just simply the song, but this passion, this drive. It is Christ and him alone. There is no other. Be motivated. Be singular of focus. Be understanding that, that the Spirit has betrothed us to Christ. He is our one husband. We are to be a church without spot and wrinkle. We are to be those who are maturing 
We understand the difference. When God says the command, we will follow. We understand the flanking attacks of the evil one. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace to us that we are those who have come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know, Lord, you will eternally love us because you will eternally love your Son. And we know, Lord, that in this day, as Paul is writing to this church, dealing with false teachers and dealing with this specific uh, problem in the Corinthian church, we glean, Lord, from that a little bit of Paul's heart and drive and passion. And it sounds, Lord, so simple as we use these words, just the, the cause and the singularity and the maturing, but, Lord, there's much that goes into that. There is a sphere of, of, of ministry in which you have placed us. And, Lord, we want to be those who are in our lane serving you, using our gifts and our talents and our abilities to be boundless with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to be those, Lord, that uh, have a ministry that is commendable by you and you alone. So, Lord, let these words, the truth of your word, rest in our hearts. We are, Lord, we are a light to a dark world. I pray, Lord, that you would um, open our mouths, that we would speak. Lord, lead us and guide us. Let that growing conviction of Christ and him alone be growing in us. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray all this according to your purpose, your plan, for your kingdom, and for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we, uh, as we close, we'll, we'll sing this song here in a moment. Um, if you have questions regarding the sermon or anything about following Christ or uh, any questions about uh, some of the things maybe I've said in there, uh, please come talk with me, um, email me. My phone number's in the bulletin. Or, or if you need prayer, I would love to pray with you and support you any way that I can. Uh, but as we close our service, if you would, one more time, let's stand together and let's sing together one true God.